Soul Ring is a Magic the Gathering card. It was first printed in 1993 in Alpha, the first print run of the first Magic the Gathering set, and went on to be printed in the other three print runs, ending in spring of 1994. It is one of the most powerful mana artifacts in the game, and has been banned or restricted in most constructed formats for basically its entire existence. It sat on the reserved list, a list of cards that Wizards of the Coast has promised not to reprint from 1996 until 2002, at which point Wizards updated the reserved list to allow reprints of the first set's commons and uncommons. The card commanded fairly high prices all through the 2000s, with it being reprinted in the limited run from the Vault Relics, but still keeping most of its value. Then it was reprinted in the first Commander set in 2011, as one of two cards included in all five of the set's pre-constructed decks. The other card was Command Tower, effectively a downsideless mana confluence. The reasoning for this choice on Wizards' part was simple. Soul Ring was considered by some to be a must-include in the then small Commander format, since, on account of it being banned in Legacy, its low double digits price was pretty affordable for its power level. So, the Precon decks should also include Soul Ring. I could say a lot about this logic. Most prominently, that Soul Ring's relative affordability was a product of it not being played in large formats. Printing sets specifically for EDH was a great way to inflate the size of the format, a process which, without a reprint, would have caused a demand spike with a fixed supply and increased the price, likely relegating Soul Ring to higher power level EDH decks. It's a problem that solves itself, one could argue. Also, the pre-con commander decks weren't exactly well constructed, so the idea that they need to keep up with the decks of longtime commander players is pretty laughable. But something you might notice is that there's a small difference between me and Wizards of the Coast. I don't make money off of how many units of the commander pre-cons get sold. And they do. So I guess I'm a little biased that way. But okay, I think it would have been fine, or even advisable, to let Soul Ring's price soar as the format size grows. Let it be a toy for the power gamers, alongside Mana Crypt, Moxon, and the like. I understand why some people might disagree, but that's my opinion. There are also people who have argued that it should be banned, such as a writer known as Chizar Licious, two months after the Commander Set's release in 2011. And well, unless somebody goes around burning every single copy of Soul Ring on Earth released after 2010, a ban would really be the only solution. But it's not going to happen. Commander's ban list is, hot take alert, kind of a stupid mess that very clearly underscores the difficulty of moderating such a large format played in so many different ways and with such a wide potential pool of cards. On top of this, Soul Ring has been printed in over a dozen commander sets. Wizards have done their utmost to place the card within the pantheon of EDH. So, Soul Ring is here to stay. But what does that mean for the game? What does the existence of wildly powerful cards at a cheap price do to a format like Commander? One of the most compelling issues with these cheap, powerful cards is that they warp the way players look at other cards. Depending on the goals of a deck and how it's constructed, it might be looking for varying quantities of mana rocks, counter spells, draw spells, and so on. You could build a framework for the deck without looking at cards, for example going, okay, this deck wants 8 ramp spells, 10 draw spells, and 12 removal spells. I should look through cards to find these quantities of cards. But come on, let's be honest. This is not how most people build decks. People see their options for ramp, draw, and removal, and they just start adding cards. The specific cards being considered then have an impact on how many of that sort of card end up in the final deck. 
As a counter scenario, one can imagine a universe in which players' removal options solely consist of naturalize, murder, lava coil, and banishing light, to be played in whatever quantities the player wants. In this universe, a player is forced to spend more time thinking about questions like, how much am I worried about enchantments and artifacts? How many creature removal spells do I need to deal with opposing pressure and wind cons? The question isn't what specific removal spells a player needs, but rather how much of these sort of stock options. Back in the real world, things end up working out a bit different than this. This is especially pronounced if a player is using a website like EDHREC, or some other metric that orders cards by popularity or quality. If you're looking for counterspells in Scryfall ordered by EDHREC rank, as I have been spotted doing from time to time, you first see Counterspell, a card that'll set you back a dollar. Great, I love it. Then you see a couple of other options that are similar with a downside, as well as a couple that cost a lot of money. By the time you get down to your standard staples, your kitchen table kings, your modern machinations of yore, it's looking a lot less tempting. You have your mana leak type cards that fall off fast in power in later turns. You have your more specialized options. And then you have your counter spells that commit the cardinal sin of costing three mana. It's easy to imagine a player seeing the rapid price increases and power decreases that happen when you scroll downward from counter spell going, well, okay. I guess I'll run Counterspell and a couple of these other ones, and then I'll have the good Counterspells within my budget. Now, it should be mentioned that Counterspell is an incredibly powerful card. Most other counter options that players can run are worse than it, yes, but I'd guess that most blue decks want lowercase c Counterspells enough that they'd benefit from running cards that are kind of a lot worse than Counterspell. A joke in my playgroup is to respond to the question of, oh, what does that card do with something like, oh yeah, it's like a worse soul ring, or oh yeah, it's basically a worse version of lightning bolt. The joke here is that these statements tell you almost nothing about the actual power of a card. It's like somebody asking how old a person is, and you saying, oh yeah, they're younger than Henry Kissinger. Helpful, thank you. As a point of contrast, we can consider other types of cards somebody might choose to run, ones whose power is less obvious. It's pretty easy to go, oh, Wizard's Retort? That's strictly worse than Counterspell. But what about if I want, say, a card that generates value when I play creature spells? Alright, Scryfall, let's go green cards that have whenever, cast, and creature in their text. And let's rank them based on EDH rec, and there. Well, okay, so there's Beast Whisperer, and there's the Great Henge, and there's Silverback Elder, and there's Primeval Bounty, and there's Glimpse of Nature, and there's Wild Pair, and there's Masked Admirers, and there's Vengevine. So which ones are the bad ones? Which ones should I add, and where should I stop adding them? These cards are pulled from all across the 57 ordered cards that pop up with my search inputs. Some are more flexible, or more bursty, or lower to the ground, but analyzing them is a much trickier value proposition than looking at counterspells. It's possible I did the math on my deck ahead of time and went, okay, I need two or three of these cards, preferably at least one in the 4-5 to five mana range, and at least one in the 6-7 to seven mana range. But if I didn't, gee, there are sure a lot of good-looking cards here. I could run Worse Counterspell or Worse Soul Ring, or I could run more of these. And Counterspells aren't the only thing to get neglected. If I'm looking for creature removal, Swords to Plowshares and Path to Exile are both under 2 bucks and absurdly powerful, with other white creature removal being much worse or much more expensive. If I'm looking for artifact removal, 
Red has a Braid and Vandal Blast, with other options once again being worse or more expensive. If I'm looking for general purpose draw for blue, there are a few low budget options. Mystic Remora is fabulous, especially with its price halved by a Dominaria Remastered reprint, and Mole Drifter, Treasure Cruise, and Archmage Emeritus all have decent spots in several different archetypes. But beyond that, things get weaker, more specialized, or more expensive. If somebody isn't setting out a framework for their deck, it's easy to imagine underdoing it on the more generalist stuff and overdoing it on the more synergistic stuff. And a deck running too much synergistic stuff and not enough general stuff is at risk of getting itself into a bimodal pickle, a state where it either falls on its face after getting a key piece removed, or it goes on to a Mach 10 march toward victory. A basic issue with having cards like Soul Ring widely available is that card quality in a given deck gets a lot less consistent at lower budgets. If you're building a deck with a budget in the high hundreds or more, you might include Counterspell alongside Mana Drain and a couple other pricey counters, along with whichever cheaper ones best fit your deck and play situations. If you needed some green ramp, you might also include Nature's Lore, along with Three Visits, a clone from Portal Three Kingdoms, a set that was almost exclusively sold in East Asian markets. Until a series of reprints recently, the only way to get this card was to pay upwards of $50 for the Portal Three Kingdoms version. And honestly, Portal Three Kingdoms could be a video topic all on its own, but I'm not going to dwell on it further today. All this is just to say that Shelling out money leads to deck consistency. There are certainly powerful cards that are cheap due to wide reprints or another reason, such as Soul Ring, Counterspell, and Source to Plow Shares. But there's an even sneakier type of budget card. The ones that cost zero dollars. A quick anecdote, I recently built a Maria Scholar of Antiquity deck. It's an equipments deck. You throw a bunch of equipments on Maria, and then tap them to generate mana and value. I kind of built it as a meme, but it's a genuinely delightful mid-power level aggro deck. Anyway, after ordering the $40 worth of mostly random bulk I needed for the list, I sat staring at the Sword of the Animist and Sword of Forge and Frontier I had in my collection. They cost no money to add, and would be so good in the deck. I put them in the deck for a few games, but they had such a warping effect that I decided to take them out. My deck's mana and value engines were pretty solid for an aggro deck, but decidedly reasonable in scope. While Explorer's Scope and Rogue's Gloves both feel very appropriate within the list, when I played Sword of Forge and Frontier, it felt like a totally different deck. And I know the fact that that's within the realm of possibility naturally shifts the way my opponents will think about my deck. Ultimately, it wasn't meant to be a particularly high-powered deck, nor could it hope of performing like a high-powered deck on the current budget. So I cut the swords. The point being made here is that you should add cards to a deck under consideration of how they'll impact the games you play with the deck, even if you own the cards and they're free to add. My quasi-meme equipments deck has a handful of specific weaknesses, and adding power cards to the deck doesn't help it manage those weaknesses with any consistency. It just makes people want to play better decks against it. An even better example is graveyard decks. Graveyard synergies are wide-ranging, fun, and potentially quite powerful, but they exist within a game that has a lot of really heavy-duty graveyard hate. There are the options like Tormod's Crypt and Rest in Peace, which straightforwardly demolish graveyard strategies, and even cards like Nile Spellbomb and Bazooka Bog, which do so without even spending a card, and with the latter dodging counterspells on top of all that. All this to say, decks heavily based around graveyards need to make a decision. Accept the need to be resilient against this stuff, usually by winning quickly or being loaded with counters for the hate, or Play at a power level where these hate cards are less common. This puts a lot of mid-power graveyard decks in an awkward spot. 
adding stronger synergies will lead to crushing unprepared decks even more than before, but we'll still end up with getting wholesale dunked on by hate cards, unless the efficiency of the deck is vastly improved to guarantee quicker or more abrupt wins. There's not necessarily a right or wrong answer here, but my mantra is that if you don't want to play higher power level, don't play higher power level. Another example of this is cheap infinite combos, namely niv and Curiosity. I've known people who went, well, this deck is running red and blue, and I've got the cards sitting right here, why not add them? If you're purely looking to increase the power level of your deck, this is fine logic, but adding an infinite combo to your deck changes the whole dynamic of games once people know it's there. As a frequent enjoyer of aggro, I often find myself asking the question, how will each of my opponents be trying to win this game? If the answer goes from, I don't know, drakes or something, to an infinite combo that requires very little setup, I'm probably going to be hitting that player with my creatures, and they're definitely going to deserve it. As another anecdote about building decks for the types of games you want to play, my brother recently got his first commander deck, a decently built Dota deck. In a night with several EDH games, everybody pulled out one of the more powerful lists every time he played the Jota deck, resulting in games where he was doing a lot, but also eating a lot of removal spells and needing to deal with a bunch of powerful nonsense from other people. The games were close, but the only game he actually won that night was in a lower power level game where he borrowed my Maria deck. At the end of the night, he proclaimed that he needed to build a lower power level deck. To bring this scattered assortment of points back down to earth a little, let's think about Soul Ring once again. A player running a budget deck might run the ever-powerful Soul Ring alongside Hedron Archive, Lockets, or other slower mana ramp. Now let's consider this effect for draw. They're running a single Consecrated Sphinx that they happen to have in their collection, alongside cards like Treasure Cruise, Blue Sun Zenith, and Body of Knowledge. Add in a few other examples like this, and it's not hard to construct an outline for their deck, where 10% of the time they chain very powerful cards and explode the entire table, but most of the rest of the time their deck performs on a much lower caliber. Some might ask, well, what's the problem with this? And, well, the answer to that is complicated, because EDH is a complicated format, with a variety of different players and power levels, and a format where table politics and the threat perceptions of individual players play a key role. In this environment, individual power cards might not necessarily pose a problem. You know, in my playgroups, Soul Ring is looked at with a minor eye roll, uh, Nice draw, bro. If the Soul Ring player gets out of hand, you hit them a bit, and hopefully things calm down. Commander is theoretically a self-balancing format, but the more inconsistently powerful a deck becomes, the trickier it becomes for other people to conceptualize the power level of that deck. At a certain point, the self-balancing will simply be hitting your deck with their creatures, or picking a more powerful deck to begin with to play against you, because they don't want to contend with the puzzle box that you're presenting them with. This video was a little meandering, so let's try and recap some of the key points here. Soul Ring is an absurdly powerful card, and I kinda hate putting it in my lower power decks, but it's not going to get banned, nor would banning it particularly constitute some kind of fundamental good for the format, in my opinion. Counterspell is also a very strong card, and absolutely should not be held as a power level baseline for counterspells, even if the card is called, well, Counterspell. If you're looking for mana rocks, counterspells, or really any other sort of supporting effect, you should ideally think about how many of these sorts of effects your deck needs before going looking, or at least be careful while looking at cards. A deck built with the tools it needs, even at a slightly lower power level, will perform well with much more consistency than the deck that only picks the strongest 3-4 to four cards for categories of cards where the deck is really looking for more like 8 or 10. 
an additional point I could flesh out more at a later date, is that sometimes the strongest option isn't even the best for the deck. If I want to drop my 4 mana commander on curve as often as possible, it might be correct to run lower power 1 or 2 drop mana ramp rather than cultivate Kodama's Reach or Harrow. Similarly, some decks might be much less worried about running 3 or 4 mana counter spells if they're cheaper or better suited to the deck than the options that cost less mana. Additionally, players should add cards to their deck under consideration of how those cards will fit into the sort of game they want to play. I could add Torment of Hailfire to my Turbo Battle Cruiser Glissa deck, and that would probably make it stronger, but my opponents are going to view the deck wildly differently if they know I have an I Win button. Playing a truly absurd number of lands is the goal of the deck and the fun part of the deck, and I don't want people to feel like they'll get flattened instantly if they let me get to 20 lands. Even if you own a card and it's sitting right there in front of you waiting to get added, in a casual EDH group, it might still be correct to leave it out for the sake of keeping the deck at a consistent power level. As mentioned earlier, if you're running a graveyard-centered deck, you could juice up the power level of your graveyard strategies. But if you're not prepared to deal with heavy-duty hate cards, you're going to be running a mess of a deck that smashes fun casual decks, but gets demolished at the first sight of a relic of progenitus. And, to bring things back to earlier points, if you're running just the most powerful of a certain effect, like ramp, removal, or draw, you're going to have a handful of games where you get those and pop off super hard, and other games where your deck is a clunky mass of high-cost synergy cards that fails to accomplish much of anything. But the bottom line is, if you have a time machine and several million dollars for bribes, we should go back in time together and prevent Wizards of the Coast from printing Soul Ring in Commander 2011.